Right, you guys it's episode 35 of inner demons i'm gonna get straight to it but before i do like i customarily always do let me just start this off first by extending my appreciation to everybody that has continued to send in positive comments positive feedback and the occasional constructive criticism also for those haters that have tapped in and have made a habit of beating your chest or just making yourself heard for whatever reason Whatever insecurity you have, I appreciate the view and I appreciate your input. It is amusing. It's, it's, it's hilarious. Some of the things that some of you guys come up with, some of the shit that you say, it's always amusing to see you guys show your asses. Anyway, I'm going to get straight to it. Episode 34, there was a lot going on. <laughs> There's a lot going on at the end of every, every episode. There was a lot going on in Corcoran. So... I had just told you guys about the incident that had happened with Weddle Smooth, Ricky. We just came off that incident. We're back on 10 day CTQ. Now, you know, everything would eventually return back to normal in the pod. And what I mean by that is the interaction, the tension, the, li the little bit of animosity that normally comes from going out to a yard with somebody. Now, I know I've said this before and, and you know, every time that we, we got into it, out there on the yard, I've always said this, that most of us, for the most part, none of us would ever talk shit and things would just go back to normal and it would be just normal program. It was a routine. Most of us that were convicts, most of us that done a lot of time, we understood that. Now, however, I, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you guys and tell you guys that there's completely no animosity. There's no tension on the tear. Look, man, you go out to a yard with somebody, you guys go out there, you throw blows, you try to hurt each other. Sometimes somebody might bring a weapon out there, whatever. So after the incident, for the most part, like I said, those of us that don't talk shit, that don't trash talk and do all that, that's one thing. However, you know, you're coming off a yard, your adrenaline is peaking, and I'm not going to tell you guys that there's absolutely no kind of tension, no animosity. Of course, there's there's a little bit, but you, you you keep it within yourself. You take it back to the cell and you cool your jets in the cell. And eventually within a, a day, the next day, a couple of days, maybe everything kind of, you know, when, once you have a chance to think about it and you realize that, hey, there's certain things that happen that I'm not in control of. There's policies that are bigger than me that I have to abide by. I'm a part of something that dictates what I do. So those of us that that are able to understand that eventually we go back to doing what we do. Doing time and and you know coexisting back there with each other. Weddle Smooth was a convict. Ricky his celly was a convict. Neither one of them talked shit. And eventually, like I said, it, everything kind of just returned back to the way it was. You know, there were there were fish lines sometimes that would get caught up or they would need something passed or something. And it, it wasn't an issue. It wasn't an issue. It would basically act like nothing ever happened. Anyway, so we're back on CTQ and we got 10 more days to get ready for the next the next round. Now, at the end of episode 34, I also told you guys that something else happened that just kind of came out of left field. So, you know, I've told you guys several times that I made a habit. I was always the one that was posted up in front of the cell. That, that's just me. I'm security conscious. Um, I'm not the kind of guy that's out there on the streets posted up in the living room looking out the curtain every five minutes. Don't get it fucked up. I'm not a tweaker. I'm just saying on the real. In that situation, I like to observe my surroundings. I'm very observant. And, and I learned that from prison. That's just something that, that prison, it, it, 
it's it, it, prison has done that to me. I, I picked up that habit from prison and it's from being in, in environments like this right here. So, you know, I, I wasn't standing at the door all day, but anytime there was any movement, any movement in the pod, somebody fishing or somebody leaving on the tier, I would get up, I'd post up and, and I'd watch. I wanted to know what the fuck was going on. So a lot of the times in the cell when breakfast would come when dinner would come or when the lunches would come i would be the one that would usually go to the door and pass everything to my cell i'm not going to say every time there were times where you know i'd be doing something and my cell was right there so he'd do it but there's a reason why i'm telling you this so you know that was pretty much something that that i just kind of took over just because that's just my that's my style. That's something that I've always done. Even when I ha had a celly, like up in the bay, um, it's a little different because you have bunks. The guy that's on the bottom bunk is usually always going to be the one out of respect to pass, you know, the guy that's up on, on his little perch, the guy that's up on the top bunk. You know, he'll, he'll be the one that, to hand him his 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 chow and his, his tray because, you know, homie got to jump down and... and you got to navigate his way down to the front of the cell. So it's it's just a respect thing. Over there in Corcoran, the beds are side by side. So it's usually it's it's up for grabs, whoever does it. And it's a respect thing too. But, uh, you know, so on one particular morning when they come with, the, with breakfast and lunches, you know, it was no particular order. The lunches came in. I handed my celly his lunch. It wasn't like... You know, it's usually a respect thing, you know, and this is something and I'm just being very detailed because this is another reason why Sellies will get into it. And this is kind of scandalous, but like somebody that's at the door that's passing out, you know, that passes food or lunches like this. You know, if you're in the bay and I've seen this happen and, you know, there's a guy that goes to the front of the cell to pass the food to his celly, it's the first tray that comes through. That's a respect thing. If you stand there and you're looking and you see, oh man, that first tray, that, that's that got the biggest piece of fucking cake on it right there. I'm, I'm gonna grab that first one. And you know, you're, you're doing that type of shit. That's just completely disrespectful and that'll get you into it. You know, it's usually, it's just, the first tray that comes through, the first lunch that comes through, you pass it to your celly. And it, again, it's it's common courtesy, it's respect thing, but you don't pick and choose, man. That's got the biggest piece of God in there right there. That's That's got the, the, the best looking fucking uh, main course. It's the fattest issue. Cats will start throwing blows over shit like that because it's just scandalous. But anyway, my point is, is so when lunches came through that day, I passed Shadow his lunch and... You know, usually I'll go through my lunch just to make sure that I got everything, make sure motherfucker didn't get cheated out his cookie and shit. You know what I'm saying? But I threw my lunch down and I was doing something. I remember that day and Shadow does the same thing. It's a habit to go through your lunch, make sure you didn't get shorted. Because if you're going to say something, now's the time to tell them while they're on the tier passing out lunches. You can't wait three hours later and be like, hey, I didn't get no cookie. Man, fuck you. You're trying to get over. You're trying to get extra cookie. That's that's how it goes. So he goes through his lunch and he finds two razors, two full razors that were fully intact. You they you could still shave with them. They hadn't been used. They were brand new razors. So you know, I have I have my theory about where they came from, and you know, I know where they came from, but. Being that it, at first I was like, man, this don't make sense because, you know, if I was, if I'm just going to say, I'm not saying that it came from the COs. I'm not saying who it came from. You guys can make your own assumptions. But I was the one that, I was the one that had the most influence in the cell out of me and, me and Shadow. I was the one that used to pretty much represent us at the front of the cell. What I mean is like the COs, when they would come over for whatever reason to the cell, I'd be the one that would that would converse with them on some level. And, 
you know, the CEOs that were looking out for us, I was the one that was, that was, you know, I would be the one speaking to them. So I felt like I had the rapport with them. Now, at first it didn't make sense because I'm like, why would they fucking, why would the Razors be in his lunch? Because the homie's like usually up on his, on his rack or he's doing something. He's, he's not the one that's, that's usually getting at him like that. But then when I start thinking about it, it's like, hold up. There's no way that they would have knew, knew who, what lunch would have went to who. They pass them both through the slot. They would, they don't know any particular order. They don't know that I passed them the first one. Is, so whoever knew, whoever put those in there, the bottom line is they knew they were coming to that cell. That was the, the thing. And the other thing is, is when all those lunches are thrown on the cart, unless that CO that passed those two lunches out right there, unless he had them put to the side and knew somehow these two lunches go to that exact cell, then they were just randomly thrown in, in that lunch in the chow hall by an inmate, by somebody who worked in the kitchen, by a kitchen worker or something. Or th there were... Maybe there were a couple lunches that had razors and we got one. I don't know. But anyway, we ended up coming up on two razors. So now we had to we had to think about it. What are we gonna do? So the first thing that we did obviously is to break the razors down so that they would be easily concealed somewhere. Break them down, put them away. So we got we got two weapons now. What do we want to do? Do we want to take these weapons out to the yard? And it was a conversation we had to have. You know, we're both parole violators. It's it's always it's always encouraged to use a weapon. However, it's up to the individual himself, especially in this situation right here. There was no set protocol. I keep telling you guys that. Nobody said you had to use a weapon. Nobody said you had to do this. You had to do that. You had to go out a certain way. It was as long as basically that you went out there, you did your thug dizzle, you did your thing, and you were representing your team. That's all that mattered. Now, we had to make a decision. So do we do we really just, just go straight motherfucking balls to the walls, straight up? straight go in you know go in on somebody and 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 slice them up or is it is this situation not really worth it i knew one thing i'm not swallowing no fucking razor i'm not going to try to bring it out like the homies were, were were trying to you know educate some of us as far as how to bring them out tie a fucking string to your tooth and swallow the motherfucker that shit's out i'm not doing it not trying it i don't give a fuck it ain't that serious I'll go out there and throw hands all day, but I'm not doing that. So I was always taught that, you know, in situations like this, that you take every advantage that you have and you use it. Now, these, these yards last tops two minutes, if that long. You go out there, you start fighting, they start busting on you. They're going to bust within a minute and... Maybe you got another 30 seconds and then you get down. Everybody prones out. You hit the deck. It's over. Nothing's that's not really accomplishing nothing. You know, so I'm sure everybody's even though we're all out there and everybody knows that this is something that we're kind of forced to do. It's 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 politics. And th these are things that we, we committed ourselves to these types of, of you know, the, these organizations, these lifestyles. So what do we do now? Shadow elected not to take a not to take a razor out there, which was fine. We sat down, we talked about it. I told him, homie, look, bro, whatever you decide to do, it's on you. We're parole violators, you know. Not that it really matters. We'll catch time if, if that's what it's going to be. But is it really worth it to go out there and, and, and slice somebody up? You don't have to. I'm not pushing that line, bro. If you want to. You know, just go out there and throw hands. It's cool, bro. You know what I'm saying? It's I, I didn't feel like it would be fair for me to push that type of line against that homie either. Now, there's a, there's a lot of other cats that probably would have felt like that. And that's why there's so many fucking dropouts, because there's, you know, there's 
cats are too heavy handed with our people, you know, at least at that time is, was what I'm speaking on. You know, cats were too heavy handed, man. Why would you push the homie to do something like that, man? You know, don't push him out the fucking door. You know, give him some options, man. And in a situation like that, really, in the totality of the circumstances, when you look at everything, what was mandated, what's not, what's being reinforced, what's enforced, would it have been fair for me to push that line and tell him, you know what, bro, you need to take a razor out there and you need to slice somebody and I'm going to do the same thing. Would it have been right for me to do that? Nah, I don't think so. However, there were, there probably would have been hermanos that would have been like, yeah, that's the way to do it right there. You know, push that line. Uh, that's what we're about. You know what I'm saying? Fucking, uh, when I, I just don't agree with that. It's lightweight, you know, it's lightweight, strong arming our people. And I was never about that. And, you know, who was I to push that line anyway? I was just a hermano at that time. And even if I would have been a C, I still wouldn't have pushed that line with the homie right there. I would have gave him an opportunity. Hey, hey, he's going out there. He's throwing hands. There's a lot of motherfuckers that ain't even doing that. So he's a good dude. He's a, he's a you know, homeboy's a soldier. He's going out. He's doing his thing. So why put that on him? And why take the chance of losing him? Because now he feels like, man, fuck, you know, I'm, I'm, I ain't signed up for this. I didn't. You know, why Why do I got to be pressed into doing something that I really don't want to do? Or, you know, I'm going to go out there and catch another three, four years now for some shit like this. It's like, look, man, we're we're not even fighting over. We're not fighting over nothing, really. It's politics and it's about trying to get our own yard. But that's it. But anyway, now I can go on and on about this. But he elected not to take a razor out that he was just going to throw hands. And I was cool with that. I decided to take my razor out. I was going to take mine out and I was going to take my chances. You know, if I had a chance to use it, I was going to use it. So it was all going to be predicated on the circumstances. What was going on, who it was, and, you know, how everything happened. So I was just going to take it, take it and um, play it by ear. So anyway... For the next 10 days, again, we go through our normal ritual of working out, doing a lot of legs, a lot of push-ups, pumping ourselves up. I did a live the other night, and some of the viewers asked, like, what type of things would you guys do to pump each other up? You know, the the, the main thing is to keep each other's morale up. It's a, it's, it's a tough situation to be in. You know, I can't always be in the homie's thoughts. I don't know what's going through his mind, but it's it's... You know, it's it's a test of your will. It it really is. You know, to be in that situation, having to to continuously keep going out, keep catching time, and you know, I don't know what the homie's thinking. There, there could be a time where he's starting to feel like, man, this ain't worth it. What the fuck am I doing? And and you know, I'm catching time for this shit, and there's really no 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 real end game to this. It's just. I don't see no no real purpose in it. It's aimless, you know. So the main thing, my main thing was to just try to keep the homies morale up. And, you know, I needed somebody to keep my morale up as well. You know, it, uh, shit. B got feelings too, god damn it. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it was, man. It was mainly just making sure that that we kept each other's morale up and that we continue continue to pump each other up as far as when we were working out, you know. Continue, go, go that extra mile, do 20 more. Enemy ain't going to let you fucking rest. Come on, man. Keep push, push, pull, strive. You know what I mean? That's what we would do. Work out, uh, you know, j just talk about situations that, hypothetical situations or just things that might come up on the yard and so that, you know, we were building each other's confidence and we were just, we were ready, man. You know, so that's, Basically, that's all you can do. There's only so much you can do. You know, your your com your level of commitment in this situation is is what everything is going to be based on. That's what it is right there. If you're really committed, you're a true believer in what you committed yourself to, then, you know, for the most part, you, you're going to be all right. You're going to get through it. But if you're on the fence at all 
eventually this type of adversity right here is going to push you out the door, especially if you end up by yourself. I'm going to tell you that right there. That's, I can't emphasize that enough. You know, the times when you're, you're by yourself, that's the time where you're, you're really going to, you know, you're really going to have to dig deep down inside and really ask yourself, you know, is this something I want to continue to do? Is this something that I really believe in? And I, I've said it before, and I'm going to say it again. Your, your loyalty shines the brightest when nobody else is looking, when you're by yourself. That's straight up. You know, my other Sally, the one that I was sold up in the beginning, you know, the one that was asking me the funny style questions, I knew that was his, that, that was his mentality. That's his true thoughts were coming out. Although he was too stupid to realize that I was understanding that, asking those questions, that basically showed me where his loyalty was at. I knew once we separated or once he got to be by himself somewhere, that he was gone. He was on the first thing smoking. Up out of there, he ain't going to the yard no more. And that's exactly what happened. So anyway, again, I really thought that after the last incident with Weddle Smooth and Ricky, I thought we were going to get put on walk alone, especially because classification had, had brought that up in committee where they basically told me, uh, Mr. Mendoza, you know, from looking at your 115s and, and some of the incidents that you've been getting in, it seems like you're becoming a management problem. And, you know, if it continues, if your behavior continues, little Johnny Mendoza, we're going to put you on walk alone because, you know, you're a threat to the safety and security of our institution. So if you keep doing what you're doing and you can't play nice, then we're going to put you on walk alone. So I honestly thought after the last situation that we were going to get put on walk alone. It didn't happen. Every day that we were in the cell, I was like, I was thinking, I was like, damn, bro, I really hope they don't split us up on me. You know, I was dreading it, and the homie was too. He's like, fuck, bro, you think they're going to, you know, the fact that they didn't do it that same day, I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know if they, if that's the way that they did it, if they waited until at the end of the 10-day CTQ, or if they did it like five days into the CTQ, if they had a, a way, a process of doing it at some point, they just split you up. I don't know, but he, neither one of us wanted to get split up. We were dreading it, so... Days went by, days went by, nothing happened. We were still there and we were like, cool, man, maybe maybe we're going to be okay. So anyway, but we, we knew that it was going to be inevitable. At some point, we continue to go out and we continue to get off. I knew that at some point, they're definitely going to split us up and they're definitely going to put us on walk alone. So for the next few days before we got ready to go out to the next yard i'm not gonna lie i was uh it was on my mind real heavy about the razor blade about you know what could happen and it just you know it the stakes were a lot higher now because i'll tell you guys as far as i knew not too many people were getting hit on the yards with weapons with razors or uh, cats bringing out perazos hitting people I think I heard about three incidents over there the whole time I was there where somebody got sliced up or the three incidents, all three of them, I believe, were with razors. I don't think anybody got stabbed or hit over there. I think they were all with razors, but that, you know, the majority of people that went out there together, they just, it was straight fisticuffs, straight just hands. That's all it was. But I was, you know... For those couple days when I was in my own thoughts, just thinking, I'm just like, man, am I making the right choice? Go go out there, slice somebody up. Fuck, you know, I'm gonna catch, I'm gonna catch some time. You don't always get, I'll tell you guys like this, in prison, like you get caught with a weapon, you slice somebody up, you stab somebody, assault somebody, assault staff, they hit you with the A1 offense, you get the 115, and then you know it's a DA referral. They send it out to the local DA. Most of the time, it's the DA don't even look at it. They're like, fuck that shit. Let that let the prison deal with that. I'm not even touching it unless it's something major. You kill somebody, uh, it's a it's an assault on staff, you maim somebody, then they'll pick it up. But for the most part, even weapons, when they catch you dead bang, they're like, nah, 
They're going to give him a year. So we're not even going to waste our time with that shit. This dude's already doing time, and that has a lot to do with it as well. If you're already doing a grip of time, they're not going to come fuck with you. They're not going to spend money prosecuting somebody that's already locked up for a long time. So, you know, I, I thought about that. I wasn't really basing it on time, catching time. It was like, that's part of the game. However, you know, you, you take a weapon out there, it, it now it changes the schematics of everything. It, it's These guys are already shooting at us. They're already, it's already known that the North Daniels were the targets over there. At least I was a, a target. Uh, like I said the other, the other day in the last episode, I, I was like a fucking, I started to feel like a magnet for that Bertha because every time they fire, I would end up getting hit with, the, with those motherfuckers. At least I take the brunt of them. Other people got hit with them. It was because they were in that same area, but I was catching most of them. So, you know, I start thinking about that, like, okay, well, if, you know, if I if I go out there and one of these gunners see me slicing somebody up, there's a, there's a good chance that you know I, I I can get shot with with the real gun because you know their policy. At least I know this, their policy, you know, the the gunners is. So they'll, 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 they'll bust out with the Bertha if they see a physical altercation. Two cats just throwing hands. They're going to hit you with the Bertha. They're usually going to go twice. Now, if somebody gets knocked down and somebody's kicking and you're kicking somebody in the head or something like that, that's cause for them to get that mini 14. If they see a weapon in your hand, that's cause for it right there. So if you go out to the yard and you engage in a, in, a, in a situation where right off the bat they see a weapon in your hand, they might grab that Bertha, but they're going to drop that motherfucker and pick up that Mini-14. As soon as they see that weapon, if they have the Bertha, they're just going to drop it. They're not even going to get off with it. They're going to hit you with that real gun. So that's something else I had to think about, you know. And I already felt like those cops over there were were singling us out, or at least I, for whatever reason, I kept getting hit with, with 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 the Bertha. So it's something that started to play on my mind. You know, the other thing is like, man, let's be honest. There's no there's no rules in war. Your objective is to hurt me. My objective is to hurt you. That's what it is. And. Everybody obviously wants to go out there and, and, you know, try to knock somebody's block off. That's you're not going out there to play with nobody. So I don't know how to explain it to you guys without sounding like a pansy ass motherfucker. But some some on some level, I felt like if I take a weapon out there and I, I slice one of these dudes up, they've been giving us fair ones. The Southsiders, at least I'll feel like, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of feel like I dishonored that unwritten agreement that we've been honoring, if that makes sense to you guys. Like, oh, you brought a weapon out now. And, you know, maybe they had action in weapons. Maybe they could have brought weapons out, but they weren't using them. I don't know. But it, it was, it was a, a thought that crossed my mind, and that's how I felt. However, I wasn't going to allow that to dictate what I ultimately did. And, you know, I chose to bring a weapon out. And whoever whoever it was, again, I'm not going to say that I was telling myself, whoever it is, I'm going to I'm cutting them up off top. It doesn't matter who it is. Like I told you guys, my thing was I'm going to play it by ear. I get into a situation like I did with Mountain uh patches spider and beaver and you know they go two on one somebody's getting sliced up point blank straight up because you know I, I learned from that situation right there as well so that that was what I decided and you know it played on my mind in the coming days up until the time we got ready to go to yard
the next yard again like i like we had done every other yard we kept track of our 10 days and i know i sound redundant but every day again we continued to be ready because there was always that one CO that just didn't care or that one CO that might have been just like, you know what, I thought your 10 days was up a couple of days ago or somebody that just didn't know. So, again, we continued. That was our routine. Even though we were on 10 day CTQ, we waited to get our workout routine on. We waited to start our daily our daily program until yard was ran. So, like I've been saying, Corkin was full of surprises. And once again, they wouldn't disappoint. The day that we were scheduled to go to yard, I, I really had anticipated that we'd probably end up going to yard with mountain and patches and maybe even possibly uh, spider and beaver might go out again. Maybe they, they might want to run it back. I don't know. I thought that was a possibility. If not, maybe they're going to run us out with Weddle Smooth and Ricky again, or maybe Lazy and Spooky. Then there were some other little younger, uh, some other youngsters, Sureños. I don't remember their names, but maybe they're going to, maybe they're going to, I believe one was name was Jose and he had a celly named Cisco or something like that. I can't remember their names, but either way, I thought it was, it was either going to be one of the cellies, but, you know, I had anticipated Weddle Smooth and Ricky again, for whatever reason, I, I just thought that maybe they're going to run it, run it back again. So, you know, they... The day of yard, we're ready. We're pumped up. We're getting ourselves, you know, hey, homie, you ready? You know, again, you guys asked that during my 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 live the other night. And, you know, I would do a couple sets of back arms, a couple sets of push-ups just to get my blood flowing and, and, you know, do some stretches and shit so that I'd be ready to go out there. My celly would do the same thing. And, you know, we, we try to get get each other's morale up. There wasn't no where we weren't talking and, and, you know, there was any kind of funk, funk in the cell, that shit was dead. We're, we're in a warlike situation right now. So we had to fucking keep a positive mind in that cell. We had to be on fucking point as far as with each other. And that's what it was. So I'm watching them do their normal routine when they run yard. They're checking all their weapons up in the control, up in the tower. The COs are... Pretty much they're cleaning up the pod after uh, serving breakfast earlier in the morning. And, you know, they're opening up doors, getting everything ready to run the yard. And I'm standing by the door. And the CEOs that normally run yard, you can tell the ones when they come in because they'll either have their leather gloves on or they'll have the white latex gloves on. You'll be hearing them pop them motherfuckers. So, you know, hey, they're getting ready to run it, bro. So, anyway, they come in the pod and they go down to the other end of the tier. So, we can't see them, but then they come and pop right up at our cell door. Never, never before had we ever went out by uh, first. We never went out first by ourselves like that. It was always they let somebody else out and then they would let us out. So, it was like, fuck. I had been there by the door the whole morning, so I know they didn't run somebody out. I knew that. I just looked at my celly like, damn, bro, they're running, the, they're, they're running us out first. So anyway, they pull us out. We get all our shit. We go out, go to the front of the pod. I so I take my razor. That's the thing. I take my razor. I got it in my mouth. I got it wrapped up in a little piece of cellophane with a little piece of fucking uh, uh, elastic from my boxers that I just put it in my lip and that's the, I'm not, like I said, I wasn't going to fucking try to swallow it. I'm not doing all that. I'm not fucking keistering that motherfucker. I'm not doing nothing else. I figured I'll bring it out like that. And that's it. Now they have a, they have a wand and you'll strip out in the pod. And then when you come out that wand, they'll wand, they'll run it down through the front. And then they'll run it down, they'll hit you in the back, and then they'll have you, you know, lift each foot up and they'll do the bottom of your feet. So we go out there, strip out, and I got it right here. I got it right here. I don't got it in the front. 
you know, I got it right here because still they want to see you when you're stripping. They ask you to open your mouth, stick your tongue out, do all that shit. So <laughs> I got the motherfucker in my mouth. And when we come out, they open up the door after we both strip out and we get ready. The fucking wand goes off when the fool puts it in front of my in front of my face. It, it goes off, right? The wand goes off, and I'm like, man, that's impossible. I'm playing it off like, the fuck? I ain't got shit. I barely got teeth in my mouth. I'm just bullshit trying to distract this dude. So then he's like, you know what? He brings it to my back, and he gets me from the back. He gets the bottom of my feet, and he's like, he does it again, and it goes off again. So he tells me to open my mouth. I open my mouth, and I just kind of, you know, I don't. I kind of open it quick, but I got the motherfucker on the side of my, on the side of my teeth and I just do it real quick. And he's like, you know, let me get this other one. So as soon as he turned, there's another CO right there. As soon as he turned, it's like my celly fucking, the boy couldn't have can't come through any, any better than he did at that point. It's like, he got an A plus step because he knew he talked. Right when that other CO walked away to get the wand from the tower to pass it through the little slot, I spit the razor blade to the side. I spit it out, landed right by some fucking mattresses that were on the wall. And my celly distracted the other CO. So it was like, if he wouldn't have done that, I probably couldn't have spit it out because the other CO would have seen. Um, nobody seen it. I, just, I spit it out that fast because I knew that there was a chance that the other one that he got was going to go off again. There's no way I, I would have known whether or not it would have or if I would have got out with it. But I wasn't going to take a chance. Call me what you want. I don't give a fuck. I spit the motherfucker out and he got the other one. Obviously, now he comes back. He hits me with it again. It doesn't go off. So they bring us out to the yard. We strip out again. We go through the motions. They open up the door. There's nobody out there. Well, obviously, when we're in that little enclosure, I looked again, but I knew I had, nobody had come out. So I knew there wasn't nobody out there, but I still looked again. Anyway, we get out there. I do a quick perimeter check. I walk around just to make sure that there's nothing out there and there's nothing out there. So as soon as I do the perimeter check, I tell my celly, I tell Shadow, bro, let's post up right here on the line. Um, let's just get it as soon as they come out. We'll just, we'll fucking go in on them. It's whoever it is, bro. Uh, fucking mountain patches, at least this way, it's not going to be a fucking, uh, if they let mountain and the celly out, it's going to be a one-on-one. -on -one. You know what I mean? Because they're not going to have a chance to bring out uh, spider and, and beaver this time because we're out there already. So who, the first two that are coming out, we're getting off right there at the door. We're going to wait for them right there. Not going to wait halfway back into the uh, across the yard or, or waste any time. We're, we're posted up right there. And, you know, just like any other yard in the past, beyond the six yard, if the opposition comes through that gate, it, you deal with it right there at the gate. So, once again, something happened that, you know, Corker, man, I swear to God, there was all kind of, every time I thought something would go a certain way, uh, they flipped the script again. So we're standing there and we're waiting and I can hear just like in the distance, I can hear the doors opening and closing. So I know somebody's coming. So I tell my cell, I'm like, ready, bro? Somebody's coming. They're bringing somebody. And it's the Africano. It's the Africano that goes the yard intermittently. I don't know what this dude's intentions are. I've never talked to him. I tried to reach out to him. He never responded back. I don't know if he thought we were Southerners. I, I don't know. He never spoke on the terror to anybody. You know, I was lightweight thinking maybe he's a J cat or maybe he's just maybe homies lost and that's just you know that's that's what it is but nonetheless it's the africano i tell myself it's, it's this africano bro 
you know what I mean? And, and uh, I forget his name. I, I had heard his name before. It was like Taylor or something like that or um, Johnson. I can't remember. But the thing was is so when he came out, when he came out and they put him in that little enclosure, before he got his cuffs off, he walked up to the window and just looked through the window. And the way that he did it, it was odd, man. It was fucking odd. I can't explain it. It just, the way he did it, it made me feel uneasy about what his intentions might be. I, di I didn't know. I didn't know if he knew we were Northerners. I don't know. But the way that he did that. I, I remember telling Shadow, hey, watch this dude, bro. You know, this dude's acting funny. So, sure enough, man, they strip him out. The door pops open. This fool rushes straight out and goes at Shadow. He goes at Shadow, and I'm already on my toes because of the way that, the way he had me feeling uneasy when he first came out. So, as soon as he went in on Shadow, I went in on him. It was like, so we're both on this dude now. I'm not going to lie. This motherfucker had hands, too. He had Jake had hands because that's what he was. For those of you that know what Jake had hands are, you know, what I'm, you guys know what I'm, I'm talking about. This motherfucker was fast. He was fast and he was chunking him. He had dookie braids and dude looked like a fucking lunatic out there, man. But he was he was. Oh boy was throwing hands, but we were throwing hands too. Unfortunately, he ended up getting the worst of it. We had him in the corner. At one point, we ended up getting him in the corner. And it didn't even, I didn't even get a chance to do what I normally do when I would go out and try to navigate my way around somebody so that I could get behind him. This dude just rushed out and we were in the the front of the yard in the corner right there. So I couldn't even get behind the dude. I had to go in on him. And he was trying to go in on my celly. So anyway, we're going at him. And you know, I got to hit you guys with the big bop, big bop, big bop. Ooh, my shoe. But we're giving it to him. Both of us, we're giving it to this fool, man. Now, I know that Shadow would like to take credit for, so this dude ends up getting dropped. <laughs> He ends up getting dropped, man. Now, I know Shadow would like to think that he's the one that dropped him, but it was me, man. I'm telling you guys, I got no reason to lie to you. I'm just telling you, he was turned sideways going in on Shadow. And, you know, he was turning, trying to trying to get him up with both of us. But I caught him with the motherfucking smoking Joe Frazier right cross and put that fool on his pockets. Well, he didn't have no pockets. I put him on his cheeks. Shadow swore up and down that that he's the one that dropped the man. And uh, it's funny, you know, homie was giving him the business too, man. But just trust me, I'm the one that put that fool on his ass, man. So anyway, when he dropped, he popped right back up. He pops right back up. And it's probably one of the only times I didn't get hit with the Bertha right off the bat because probably because this fool, um, the gunner, maybe he couldn't shoot straight. I don't know. But not only that, we were way up in the front of the yard. Usually, you know, when there were fighting out there, we're like towards the back or the middle or somewhere like we're all over the yard, but we were smashed up in the front in the corner. Anyway, he bust the first time with the Bertha. It does. I don't remember it hitting me. It didn't hit me. And um, then he racked it again. He bust again. And that was it. I remember he grabbed the mini 14. I heard him chamber the motherfucker. And, you know, this Africano, he waited till he we waited till he got started to get down. But he was waiting until we got down, too. So he was a J-cat, but he wasn't a, a complete J-cat. He knew what was going on. You know, the funny thing is he didn't say nothing, though. He didn't say nothing. When we were proned out, I told him, I said, hey, homie, you know we're Northerners, right? I told him that. And he just looked at me. 
he didn't say shit. He didn't respond. He didn't, you know, acknowledge. Like I was expecting him to say, nah, no shit, man. He's like, he didn't say nothing. I just told him just like that. I'm like, hey, homie, hey, you know we're Northerners, right? We're North Daniels. And he, he didn't respond. He just looked at me. And when they came out, he was the first one that they pulled off the yard. He just bounced up and, and took off. So he became an enemy at that point as well. Um, you know, it was it, it was obvious that he was a J cat and that um, no matter who he went to yard with, he was gonna fight. <laughs> I, I just think that he thought everybody was against him. So that's what it was. Anyway, I wouldn't never have any more incidents with the, with that dude. That was it with with him. It was a one and done. Anyway, so when me and Shadow get pulled in the building, we get medically cleared and we're we're in the cages. And I have a funny feeling about this time because we're out there a little bit longer than norm than we're normally out there. Usually, they come in, we get medically cleared, they'll they'll take us back, and that's it. But now we're out there for a while. So I'm thinking, damn, I wonder if these motherfuckers are going to split us up. And sure fuck enough, that's what they did. They ended up moving shadow. I'm not going to lie to you guys, man. It was, you know, when, when, when you've been with somebody like that and you're in a situation where you're, it's you it's considered like enemy lines back there. You're, you're behind enemy lines. You're in, a, in an environment where, you're trying to hurt people. People are trying to hurt you. And, you know, you get used to feeding off of somebody else's energy and looking for that moral support, trying to help each other build up that morale. And then somebody gets taken away. It's it's discouraging. I, even for me, I'm going to tell you guys straight up. I'm not going to I'm, I'm going to keep it 100 with you guys. They took them. I was I was down in the dumps, man. I was like, fuck, bro. You know, not just because I didn't have a motherfucking, uh, you know, a good homie there with me, you know, a partner, bro. But also, you know, I worried about the homie too, man. Is he going to be all right? You know, he was, he was younger than me. I had more influence than him. I had been around longer, longer than him. He looked up to me, but at the same time, Shadow had a mind of his own. He had a mind of his own. And a lot of times, you know, what I used to look for in Sally's, he had it, he, you know, he would be able, sometimes he seen things and told me and, or sometimes he thought about something and, and ran it by me. And I, and it was good because, you know, I can't always be the thinker. I can't always be the one that, you know, gives you strength. Sometimes you got to give me some strength too. Sometimes you got to help get my morale up. And, you know, the homie, the homie was there, man. The homie, uh, you know, solid dude, got nothing but love and respect for him. Somebody asked if if I'm still in touch with him. Unfortunately, no, I was in touch with him for a while after, you know, we both got out of Corcoran. We stayed in touch. And, you know, those type of relationships um, where you've been in the trenches with somebody like that, man, uh, you know, those those are lifelong friendships. I wish I was in touch with him. I, I hope he's okay. Hopefully, you know, I, I've, I've been hoping that someday maybe he might see, you know, this YouTube channel and reach out. But as of right now, I haven't heard of him. I don't know where he's at. I don't know um, nothing about his situation. So, you know, he gets moved, man. And now it's, it's, it's a, you know, I've been used to being by myself. You know, I've been solo bolo before, man, and you know, I had to I had to find a way to to just keep my 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 own morale up and to keep myself focused on on what it was. I was left behind. There were I had adversaries all around me. There was no other homies over there, so you know, it was another it was it was some more adversity that that um that that I felt but I had, I had dealt with adversity before in the past. So I was okay. You know, I knew I would get through it again. It was another test on my resolve, but you know, that shit wasn't going to break me. I was committed and I'm not saying that like I'm trying to be tough, but I was committed to this shit. 
um, you know, I believed in it wholeheartedly. So a lot of the times when I was by myself, that's when I used to try to shine the brightest, man. Uh, when I was up there in the bay and I was in a pod all by myself, you know, I conducted myself like a soldier. And your adversaries respect that. They see it. You know, they see it. Hey, homie's in there by himself, you know, but you can tell he's, he's homie's about his shit. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, you know, after he was gone, it, it took me a couple of days to, to be able to readjust to it, to being by myself. And, you know, I, I slid back into my own little routine and, and that's what it was, man. Now, a couple of days later, that same week, I ended up going to classification. Classification again, for those of you that missed it in episode 34, so classification or ICC, institutional classification, is basically, it's like a hearing that you go to every 30 or 90 days and you'll go in there and there'll be like an assistant warden, excuse me, somebody from the IGI, you'll have somebody from mental health, you'll have a counselor, and then you'll have a you know, variety of other staff, staff members that will sit in on that hearing. Now, the whole purpose for it is for basically it's, it's for them to, you know, go through your file and, and basically give, give an update about how you're programming. You know, are you picking up time? They'll go through your whole file. They'll open up your file. OK, Mr. Mendoza, we see here that you're a second termer, that you're doing a parole violation. You got convicted at a San Francisco County for three strong arm robberies. You've been here since whatever, such and such date. Um, and then that's when it came. So, Mr. Mendoza, we believe the last time that we came in here, we told you that you were becoming a management problem. And as, as we see, you've continued to go out to the yard and engage in physical altercations. So you're obviously not getting along with other inmates. And, you know, I'm... Again, I'm sitting there listening to this dude like, so basically what you're telling me is what I felt like saying. So basically what you're telling me is that, you know, because I'm going out to a yard where you guys are staging these fights and I'm participating, I'm fighting my adversaries. You guys want to put me on walk alone. That's basically what it was. So, you know, they gave me the speech and said, you know, because... You're, you're, you have a, a, a consistent pattern of going out and fighting with other inmates. We're going to place you on 30 days walk alone. So that's what happened. You know, um, I didn't say nothing, didn't respond. What, 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 what could you really say? You know, like I said, in, in my mind, I'm just laughing at these fools. I'm listening to them like, man, you motherfuckers, man. It's like, what do they expect? They put known documented enemies out on the same yard. And I don't know, like, what, what do you guys expect? You guys expect us to all sit Indian style in a circle and sing Kumbaya? Like, is that what you guys think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen when you have documented enemies going out to the same yard? We're going to fight. That's, that's what's going to happen. So... Uh, Mr. Assistant Warden, you know, how about how about you guys stop playing games? How about you guys stop putting people on yards together that you know are not going to get along, that are not compatible? But you can't say nothing. So I took my 30 days on the chin and got the fuck up out of there. There's there was nothing to, to say. Um This is probably a good time to cut this one right here. You know, we're coming. There's another incident that I'm going to cover in episode 36. I believe in my q and I prematurely released, uh, uh, you know, the, some of the individuals that I got into it with. So those of you that watch the Q&A, you guys already know that there's another individual that I'd end up getting them up with. Um. You know, but still, there's there's some other things that happened during the the course of the last incident. But 
you know, I'm trying to cover as much as I can with you guys. I know that Corcoran and that whole that whole incident is it, it piques a lot of interest. A lot of people want to know everything about it. And I've tried to do my best to give you guys the mindset, the, the physical part that's involved, everything from the COs that were playing games to the betting. I hope I haven't missed, you know, any part of it. And if I have, now is your guys' time to go ahead and, and hit me with some questions or make some comments and let me know what you want me to elaborate on so that I can touch on it in episode 36. You know, I know I haven't really talked too much about the betting part of it, but put it like this. They were betting all the time over there. Every fight that was happening over there was was it was by design the 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 way that they were arranging the yard setup who was going out with who it was by design it was it was it was predicated on or it was dictated on bets on who was betting that's what it was and i knew this through the co that identified itself as a north daniel um you know he's the one that He's the one that told me a little bit more about the bets and, and, you know, some of the bets that were happening in other buildings and the bets that were happening in our building and, you know, how they were betting big, big money. I can tell you that you guys that right now, and they weren't just betting fucking sodas and, and 15, $20. They were putting, I got the impression, I never got a number amount, but I got the impression from just things that I heard that it was a lot of money. And, you know, so there were there were incidents that were being taken out to the parking lot uh, because of disagreements. This shit was it was a big thing over there. The betting part of it was a big thing. One of the CEOs one time when we were going out to the yard, had even told us, hey, we got big money on you guys, man. You guys better fucking do your thing. And, you know. I know that there's some, some of the viewers are like, man, you know, you guys were getting played and, you know, you guys were fucking uh, playing right into their little game. And, yeah, you know, I'll take that, man, because, you know, I committed myself to an organization that was politically invested in this shit and I had to do what I had to do. That's that's all I can say. Uh, I, I, um, I made a choice to commit myself to something and... Because of that, you know, I had, I was, I, at some point, I was a follower. I was being a follower. I was letting somebody else dictate what I was doing. And we all were, you know, we all were. From the little guy all the way up to the big cat. All of us do. So, you know, that's what gangs do. Um, You know, there's not a whole lot more that I can say on the betting aspect of it because it's like I wasn't right there at the table when these motherfuckers were betting. I knew it was taking place. I knew just from the comments that I caught that it was, you know, some of these fights were big money. And, you know, it was always they were always betting on them because it wasn't it wasn't being ran normally on the days when the days when these guys knew nothing was going to happen when we were on 10 day ctq or you know there was somebody else if there was somebody else in the section that was going to fight and they knew it when you know when they were on ctq they would just run the yard and it would just be the the guy in the tower by himself and the regular seals that ran yard but on the days when they knew something was going to kick when we were coming off ctq it was our day to come out or something like that all of a sudden, <clears throat> you see a bunch of fucking COs in, in the tower, like a bunch of them, you know, six, seven of them, when there was no purpose for them to be ever be over there. But it's unless it was a super coincidence that every time we got ready to go out to the yard or something was going to happen, all these COs come over there <clears throat> and they all, for me to believe that they just all came over there because they all got called over there to to beef up security i can't believe that they were all over there because they were betting they were placing their bets and they all wanted to see see fights like i told you guys 
We used to call it the fucking uh, the rooster coop or the chicken coop because that's the, the, the hen coop or whatever. Motherfuckers are calling it different shit. But that's why, because what, you know, what guy doesn't want to see these type of fights? It's like backyard fights or what kind what guy doesn't want to see a good good old fashioned fist fight? You know, the, the it was the same with them, basically. So it, it was what it was, man. Um anyway, like I said, I think this is a good place to cut it. This episode 35, I'm gonna probably wrap it up in episode 36. But again, if there's anything you guys want me to touch on, now's the time because once we get done with this inner demons is going to continue on but the shoe war is for me it's going to be over it's going to be concluded probably in episode 36 so there's only so much i can speak on this stuff anyway with that being said hopefully this episode right here will make the cut i'm critical if i think it's boo boo if it's garbage i'll fucking sit on it and i'll, I'll try to redo it we'll see what happens hopefully sandman can work his magic edit this shit so it won't look too fucked up and you know i'll get it out to you guys hopefully by tonight with that being said if this makes it out tonight happy thanksgiving to all of you guys like i said man enjoy your your time with your families let your kids and your loved ones know those who are near and dear let them know that you're thankful for them Life's too short, man. Put those differences aside. It's all about family. Anyway, with that being said, man, this episode 34, or is this episode 35? Shh, I'm lost. 34, 35, whatever. This your boy B, and I'm out.